Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here at CSIS. I'm delighted to um, have you all here this afternoon. Clearly, from the size of the crowd, um, we can gauge the interest in the issue. Uh, we're delighted to have Assistant Secretary Johnny Carson um, with us this afternoon to discuss and take questions on the new tack that the Obama administration is, has launched in U.S. Somali policy. Uh, this new strategy, which was launched, uh, was announced last month, is being called a dual track strategy, uh, one that doesn't abandon U.S. support to the fragile and divided uh, transitional federal government in Somalia, uh, but that strengthens engagement with the autonomous governments in Puntland and Somaliland, and uh, that strengthens engagement with um, other local government authorities and perhaps clans and subclans in South Central Somalia. Uh, the stated intention is to strengthen the ability of these governments to deliver development and services that will make their communities less vulnerable to incursion and recruitment uh, by the extremist insurgency al-Shabaab. I think this is generally being viewed uh, so far, and we can hear from um, Secretary Carson, as a positive shift, uh, one that gets beyond a narrow security approach and one that may galvanize uh, even the TFG to make greater effort at resolving its internal divisions and getting on with the governance agenda, uh, which it so far has failed pretty miserably to do. Um, it's clear that there are no easy or quick fixes in Somalia. Disengagement is not an option, uh, given the humanitarian, regional, and international impacts that the conflict there is having. Uh, but engagement in Somalia has always been risky. Uh, the U.S. has made some serious policy blunders, I think, in the last decade. Uh, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend strategy has not really worked out um, the way it's supposed to in Somalia. Uh, and money and assistance uh, tend to skew incentives and alliances in unexpected ways. I'm pretty certain that no one here is more aware uh, of these risks and these uncertainties than Assistant Secretary Carson. Uh, he is one of our most experienced diplomats, certainly on Africa, uh, one, of Af uh, one of Washington's most thoughtful um, Africa analysts. Uh, he has been so actively engaged on multiple <laughs> intractable and difficult problems recently, uh, Sudan, DRC, Nigeria, Kenya, to name just the, a few. Um, and we're delighted that you've been able to take time with us today to, to sketch out a little more in detail uh, what this new strategy entails. Secretary Carson, thanks. Jennifer, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you also for convening uh, this group to discuss the situation in Somalia. Uh, I'm extremely pleased by the size of the audience, and I'm extremely pleased to see uh, a large number of people uh, with whom I have had an opportunity to work on many issues uh, in, uh, in, on Africa in the past. Uh, I see both Ambassador Yates, uh, including uh, John Yates, a, a dear friend and colleague who probably knows as much as anybody in this town these days about uh, Somalia, and we certainly appreciate what he's uh, contributed in terms of our understanding and analysis. Uh, I see others in the audience, including Pauline Baker, who does a marvelous job of keeping us all straight about uh, states uh, going uh, in the right direction or the wrong direction, and, uh, and her index is one of the things that uh, uh, keeps uh, us uh, on track as well. Uh, many others in the audience uh, as well. Uh, again, uh, good to see all of you. Uh, and thank everyone for taking time out of your very busy schedules uh, to come here this afternoon to join in this discussion. Somalia's ongoing conflict is among uh, our top concerns in Sub-Saharan Africa today. Uh, I would like to address the dual track strategy that we are currently pursuing uh, in Somalia. But before that, uh, I'd like to put into context uh, what we see happening uh, in that country and in that region. Somalia is a long running and enormously complex political and security problem, which has created 
and also exacerbated an ongoing humanitarian crisis. Over the past two decades, instability has ripped apart Somalia's internal social fabric, spilled into neighboring countries, and produced security threats for nations hundreds, even thousands of miles away from East Africa. Somalia's instability has unfolded like an aggressive cancer, which has metastasized from a local to a regional and now to a global problem, a problem that can no longer be ignored by the international community. Somalia's ongoing crisis has spawned one of Africa's worst uh, refugee emergencies. Hundreds of thousands of Somalis have fled by land and sea to neighboring states. There are more than 600,000 Somali refugees scattered across uh, the region, including approximately 340,000 uh, in Kenya and over 165,000 uh, in Yemen across the Red Sea. In, Ken in Kenya, the Dadaab uh, refugee camp, originally uh, established in the 1990s to accommodate approximately 90,000 people, now comprises three separate camps with over 292,000 refugees. Kenya has borne the brunt of the Somali refugee crisis. An average of 5,000 Somali refugees pour across the border uh, each uh, month, according uh, to UNHCR statistics, placing an enormous drain on Kenya's infrastructure uh, and financial resources. This year, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees has had to request $270 million in international donor assistance to support Somali refugees in the Horn of Africa. And this figure is likely to continue to grow in future years. The international community has also been impacted by the dramatic upsurge uh, in piracy off the coast uh, of Somalia. The trends are both alarming and deeply disturbing. In 2007, pirates targeted 30 ships. By 2009, that number had risen to 218. In total, over the past three years, 450 ships have been attacked and pirates have seized nearly 2,400 hostages and received an estimated $100 million in ransom. Currently, Somali pilot pirates hold 17 ships and 366 hostages. Ransom demands average $4 million per vessel. The cost of protecting commerce by sea are large. Nearly 30,000 ships transit the Gulf of Aden annually, and some two dozen countries have deployed naval assets to combat piracy in the Red Sea. But Somali's piracy problem stems from the instability and conflict on the land, not the problems at sea. In addition to the problems of human suffering, refugees, and piracy, Somalia has also become a flourishing smuggler's bazaar for illegal arms and contraband, as well as the safe haven for a small group of Al-Qaeda terrorists who were responsible for the 1998 bombings of the U.S. embassies in Dar es Salaam and in Nairobi, Kenya. The absence of an effective government in Mogadishu has allowed foreign fighters associated uh, with Al-Qaeda to entrench themselves in Somalia and to link up with al-Shabaab, the Somali extremist group that is attempting to take over Mogadishu and South Central Somalia. While al-Shabaab is not a monolithic organization, many of its senior leaders have found common cause with al-Qaeda and have embraced its tactics. Al-Shabaab's suicide attacks are a reflection of this. The ongoing effort to recruit young Somali men from the diaspora, including some who have
been attracted from places like uh, Minneapolis and Seattle has also added another dimension to the challenges we and others in the international community face in dealing with Somalia today. As the global impact of Somalia's instability escalates and causes ripples far beyond that country's borders, the necessity of a more aggressive international response is apparent. The international community's response to Somalia's deepening crisis has been too feeble, too slow, and too order uncoordinated to have the desired impact. And the world is paying the consequences today as the humanitarian and security threats continue to emerge. If the status quo prevails, in the years to come we will pay an even greater price in terms of regional destabilization, piracy, and terrorism. No one nation can solve the problem alone. We all must do our part if we want to achieve a durable solution. We must recognize that this problem has been 22 years in the making and will take more than just one or two or three months to resolve. We must also recognize that we may need to employ different strategies and tactics to achieve our goals. Although pundits and academics have provided valuable and very useful analysis for understanding the scope and the complexity of the Somali problem, no one has come forward with a viable or realistic formula for resolving this crisis. The United States intends to remain engaged in the effort to find a long-term solution. Together with our regional and international partners, we will pursue policies that promote stability and security, economic recovery and development, and the improvement in the country's humanitarian situation. We will also work with the government in Mogadishu to slow down and stop the inflow of foreign fighters. We have already devoted significant financial and diplomatic resources in the pursuit of these shared goals, and we will continue to do so in the days ahead. On the security front, the United States supports the African Union and other regional partners in their efforts to stabilize Somalia. We are pushing to strengthen the capacity of the African Union mission uh, in Somalia so that it can carry out its mandate of defending the TFG and its government uh, institutions. We have obligated uh, approximately $229 million in financial assistance to AMISOM since 2007. This is in addition to our assessed contributions through the United Nations. We have obligated $35 million since 2007 to invigorate the TFG's efforts to establish an effective, broad-based national security force that can protect the people of Somalia and de to defeat uh, Shabaab. This uh, has taken the form of budgetary assistance, uh, in-kind materials, and security training for the TFG's military. In an effort to address the suffering of millions of Somalis, the United States uh, has provided more than $180 million in humanitarian aid and $60 million in development assistance since 2009. And we intend to continue these efforts, which include important economic and educational development support. As Somalis struggle to restart uh, and reestablish government institutions, we have provided media advisors to the TFG's Ministry of Information and help set up an independent accounting me mechanism to reduce corruption in the TFG's financial operations. With our support, the TFG has established 
youth employment projects and microfinance program to assist small-scale entrepreneurs. We hope shortly to provide financial advisors to the TFG's Ministry of Finance. We will continue to back the institutional development of the TFG to help it become more effective, make it more inclusive, and to improve its financial transparency. But the TFG must do more to help itself. It must move beyond being a government uh, in name only. And it must stop uh, its recurring cycle of internal political fighting. Repeated leadership changes at the top of the TFG have undermined its credibility among many Somalis and fail to improve the TFG's record of governance, security, and service delivery to its citizens. Too many TFG leaders have been preoccupied with personal, business, and clan interests. In the remaining months of the transitional period, which ends in August 2011, our continued engagement with the TFG will focus on supporting progress on key trans national and, uh, and transitional tasks aimed at moving the political and reconciliation process forward. The international community and the TFG must find a better way to engage with a larger array of Somali actors and to draw them into a broadened uh, peace and stabilization process. Transitional tasks, including the consultations on the Constitution, should be implemented with that broad political goal in mind. Over the last 18 months, we uh, in the State Department in Washington have worked primarily along a single strategic track that focused on supporting the Djibouti process, the transitional federal government, the government of Sheikh Sharif, uh, and Amasam. Clearly, at this point, to be more effective, we need to broaden our engagement to include uh, a second, more comprehensive strategic track. This dual track approach takes into account the complex nature of Somali society and, and politics and will allow our engagement to become more flexible and adaptable to local needs and aspirations of all of Somali's citizens. Under this uh, new second track of our strategy, we will uh, pursue increased partnerships with the regional governments of Somaliland and Puntland, as, a, as well as with local and regional administrative units throughout South Central Somalia, who are opposed to El Shabaab, but who are not allied to the TFG. We believe there are a large number of groups in South Central Somalia that are committed to promoting stability, responsible local govern governance, and economic development in and for their communities. We intend to seek those units out and to work with them. We also intend to allow, as security uh, permits, more American diplomats and USID development experts to travel to Somaliland and to Puntland, and eventually to other regions uh, to engage directly with local government officials in those areas and to initiate small-scale development projects. In the case of Somaliland and Puntland, the dual track policy recognizes the progress and relative stability in both uh, of those areas, as well as the business, clan, and marriage-based interconnections among Somali regions and the degree to which stability in one region can potentially contribute to stability in other parts of the country. In, the, in June of this year, Somaliland showed the world that it was capable of conducting a free and fair presidential election and a peaceful
political transition, not only between leaders, but between political parties. Somaliland's electoral success demonstrates that Somalia is not inherently unstable and that democracy, governance, peaceful political dialogue, and economic progress are indeed possible. The United States will encourage greater political and economic development in Somaliland and intends to enhance our engagement there to support it. While the United States does not plan to recognize Somalia's independence, we think there should be ways for the international community to assist in even greater civic progress in that political country. Before saying something about Puntland, uh, I would want to acknowledge the contribution that former President Riali made to Somaliland's, Somali, Somalia stability and political development through his graceful transfer of power to the new administration. That was an important political statement. In Puntland, we are working with non-governmental organizations to build the capacity of governance institutions to address the root causes of instability and piracy. However, we remain concerned that Puntland <laughs> However, we remain concerned that Puntland has reduced the space for free and open media to the detriment of its own political developments. We want to forge a stronger relationship with Puntland, and we encourage a renewed dedication by that regional government to the principles of freedom of expression and democracy, and we urge that government and its leadership to take much more aggressive action against piracy that originates from its shores. In South Central Somalia, we are expanding uh, our outreach and engagement with local and regional leaders and with groups who are working towards peace. In addition, we will continue to reach out to the various elements of Al-Sunawa Al Jamaa who are actively engaged against Al-Shabaab and interested in peace and stability. In the city of Galkayo, we are working with both sides of the historically divided city to promote economic development and political and security cooperation. We are supporting a recent youth initiative and working to improve the IT services at Galkayo University. In Gal Gadung region, we are working with the regional government to develop its governing institutions and to assist its efforts to deliver improved services to its people. I want to make clear that although the United States has a long-term commitment to Somalia's stability, it is the Somalis themselves who must take uh, the lead. The United States can only play a supporting role in collaboration with other international partners. No solution is possible without Somalis themselves, including Somalis who live in the diaspora. All must be committed to working together to find solutions to Somalia's many challenging problems. I am confident that there are indeed local, regional, and national leaders among the Somali people inside Somalia, in the greater horn of Africa, and including uh, in the United States, who are determined, resilient, and courageous enough to work towards a more stable Somalia. The United States will continue to support uh, such leaders and the Somali people achieve their goals. Somalis uh, living across the United States can play a crucial role, not only here, but also back in Somalia as well. We are working hard to explain our efforts in Somalia to this diaspora community and to listen to their ideas, their concerns on how we can help Somalis to bring about positive change in that country. We are also working 
with our international partners to promote global efforts to work more intensively with their diaspora communities in an effort to magnify our own work. The Istanbul Conference last May made a significant contribution toward this effort to mobilize the Somali diaspora globally, including over 80 key businessmen and social leaders from around the world. We will also continue to put on notice what, whatever their affiliations, those who are profiting uh, financially from Somali uh, instability uh, will be exposed. Corruption from uh, any sector saps whatever strength there is in the economy and it must be controlled at every level. We will continue to use sanctions uh, as a tool to prevent spoilers uh, from further contributing to Somalia's uh, instability. Uh, there are no easy answers or solutions in Somalia. There is no guarantee that our new dual track uh, strategy will achieve the progress uh, that we desire. If our strategy needs to be revised, we will do so. Walking away and letting Somali and Somalis fight it out amongst themselves is in no one's interest. And Somalis' problems are no longer uh, simply local ones. Refugee flows, uh, pirate attacks, and terrorist threats will continue to increase unless we work with Somalia to deal with these issues. We are extremely grateful to a number of countries in the region and in the international community who are making important contributions to security and humanitarian efforts in Somalia. But we encourage many others to join in this effort. However, I would be remiss if I did not say that more countries need to come forward with meaningful contributions. Somalia's uh, in international contact group meets very frequently in nice cities and capitals around the world. But these forums need to produce more significant financial and material contributions to advance the process of peace and reconciliation in Somalia and to better coordinate international efforts. If we are going to change the situation on the ground, the international community will simply have to do more. More countries will have to contribute to AMISOM. Thus far, only Uganda and Burundi have provided troops for this African-led mission. More African countries and perhaps some moderate Arab and Islamic countries should con consider troop contributions. We hope that uh, African states uh, such as Kenya and South Africa and Tanzania will uh, possibly con contribute maritime assets to Amasom to help stem the flow of arms and foreign fighters into the port of Kismayu. Al-Shabaab uses Kismayu to the detriment uh, of the Somali people. The Arab League uh, should be more actively uh, engaged uh, in uh, Somalia. Uh, Egyptian, uh, Yemen, and Saudi interests have all been hurt uh, by the explosion of piracy uh, in the Red uh, Sea. We understand that at the recent Arab summit in Libya, the Arab League agreed to give the transitional federal government some $10 million per month in unrestricted budgetary support. I urge uh, the Arab League to fulfill its commitment and to make sure at the same time that its money is spent transparently and in the interest of the Somali people. We have our consistently supported uh, UN uh, and AU uh, interests in establishing permanent missions uh, in Mogadishu. Uh, and I would take this opportunity uh, to underscore uh, our support uh, for their efforts uh, to put people on the ground uh, on a full-time basis. 
Amasom forces are putting themselves on the line and playing a part in the solution, not just to a national, a regional, but a global crisis. And therefore, uh, countries uh, around the world, from Europe uh, to Asia, need to provide increased uh, military equipment uh, and financial assistance to support uh, Amasom and the TFG effort. New or surplus uh, military equipment from European, Middle Eastern, or, or Asian states would go a long way in assisting current and future uh, Amasom uh, deployments. The international response to combating piracy has been incredible, but a task force at sea does little to combat the problem on land. The governments uh, of Kenya uh, and the Seychelles have borne the greatest burdens in prosecuting and incarcerating suspected pirates within their courts. Victim states of piracy should and must assume greater responsibility for pursuing legal action in their own countries against suspects engaged in criminal acts of piracy on the high seas against their maritime assets. At the same time, more must be done financially to assist regional states like Kenya, Tanzania, and the Seychelles to give them the capacity to arrest and prosecute and incarcerate for long periods of time those individuals caught and found guilty of piracy. If victim states and industry representatives funnel even a fraction of the resources they spend on ransom payments into helping Kenya and other regional states to prosecute and jail pirates, this would send a strong message of deterrence uh, for those who attempt those kinds of actions. As a part of our comprehensive approach to Somalia and the Horn of Africa, we have helped pass UN Security Council Resolution 1844 that imposed sanctions against those who support uh, al-Shabaab and other violent extremists uh, in uh, Somalia. On a daily basis, we continue to uh, partner with the willing countries in the region to reduce the negative flows of finances, arms, and other support to violent, violent extremists in Somalia and to uh, uh, do everything that we can to uh, interdict the uh, spread of violence beyond Somalia's borders. We continue to be willing to improve our relationship with Eritrea, but call on that country to join the international community in our efforts to stabilize Somalia and to promote the welfare of the Somali people. The efforts that we are pursuing in Somalia are a part of a comprehensive interagency process involving the State Department, the Defense Department, Justice, and Treasury, and reflect our strong commitment to advance our overall efforts in a united uh, and consistent manner. Uh, I would uh, like now to just briefly thank Jennifer uh, and CSIS for organizing uh, this discussion uh, today. Uh, let me share one last thought with you before uh, we open up uh, for discussion. Uh, as I said at the top of my remarks, Somalia's instability is a national, regional, and global problem that demands uh, all of our attention. However, the United States can not solve this problem alone. Somalis have the greatest stake in their country's fate and its future, and they uh, must unite together to help find a pathway uh, out of the difficult two, two decades uh, that they have experienced. The United States will aid Somalis in this quest to find peace, and we hope that the international community will walk with us as we do so. Thank you. Much, uh, Secretary Carson. 
We're going to turn uh, to the floor and take a, a few questions at, the time, at a time. I guess I wanted to, to start out a little bit with how you see our engagement with the TFG ultimately unfolding. Uh, you know, how are we building incentives into that relationship to get them to, to behave in, in different ways than, than they have? I mean, is there conditionalities attached? Or what, what are the incentive structures we have there for them, uh, would you say? I'll just throw that out one, because that one that plagues me all the time. I'm not sure how to do that. And let's take a couple of questions mm -hmm. at a time. Tony here. Tony <laughs> Um, Tony Carroll, Manchester Trade, and I teach a course at SAIS, Johns Hopkins. Um, Ambassador Carson, with reference to your interagency working group, you noted that Treasury is involved. Um, one of the constraints in trying to get resources into Somalia is to um, uh, remove the impediments to um, money remittances. Money re remittances represent up to 40 percent of the GDP of Somalia and represent a, a, a valuable but yet under utilized a uh, tool for the country's reconstruction and development. Yet uh, money remittances from this country, which are the largest contributions of money remittances into Somalia, are very much uh, impeded by uh, current restrictions uh, largely under FinCEN, which restrict, uh, un I think, unnecessarily uh, these flows into Somalia. Um, Treasury is, of course, aware of this uh, problem. Uh, there is uh, much, uh, it's very tactical, as you know, but uh, we, we really, keep stumbling on the same issue for the last, uh, since 2004, since the August uh, declaration by FinCEN, 2006, August yeah. of 2006. So um, I'm wondering if there's a diplomatic pressure point that can be brought to Treasury to try to help uh, loosen these remittances. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Ambassador Carson, I did ask almost similar question, and I'm glad today that you spoke about the dual policy that you talked about on the follow-up uh, uh, forum at the White House that I've asked. You're right, the humanitarian crisis in Somalia is uh, much catastrophic than has been talked about, worse than Darfur. My concern, however, is, uh, though I'm glad that you came up with a policy, Somalia has suffered eight years of a war on terror, and the problem that it has caused, we have seen 1.5 million people on, that are displaced, internally displaced, 3.6 million that are on the verge of starvation, and everything else that you have talked about as far as the refugees are concerned. Now, my question is, the dual track policy has been in place for 20 years, and I'm surprised that the United States has been blindfolded and being convinced to take the same route. This policy has been in place and has been provided and taken by Ethiopia. So what difference will it make now? You're only encouraging more regions to become and say, uh, to become independent and say that they have administrations. And since the policy, two ad presidents have been declared, by the way, and two regions and more are coming. Thank you. Okay. You want to take those three to start? Sure, to start? sure. Thank you uh, very much for uh, all three of those questions, uh, very interesting ones uh, uh, and important at the same time. Let me go in, in, in reverse uh, order. Uh, our dual track uh, strategy uh, is new and reflects a uh, evolution uh, in our thinking uh, towards a uh, crisis that has been uh, 21 years, 22 years uh, in the making. Uh, I think I said that uh, the first part of that strategy is to continue to support uh, what has been an African-led uh, process. Uh, it is uh, support for Djibouti process, it's support for the TFG, uh, it's support uh, for the uh, AU and EGAT decision to uh, place uh, peacekeepers, Amazon, uh, on the ground there. Uh, but we also uh, recognize uh, that uh, it is equally important uh, to recognize uh, the relative stability and the progress that has occurred uh, in the other two parts of uh, Somalia, uh, both Somaliland where we have seen elections there, uh, 
uh, that have in many ways been better than some uh, elections in other parts uh, of Africa. Uh, and also the relative stability uh, that we have seen uh, in Puntlan. Uh, but we see uh, and have seen the emergence of a number of uh, groups uh, uh, and organizations uh, in clan and sub-clan structures in South Central uh, that uh, are not allied to the extremist elements of Al-Shabaab, but are not a part uh, of the TFG, and we think they too uh, deserve and warrant uh, support. By doing this, uh, we are not in any way uh, attempting to uh, go around uh, what is in fact uh, the uh, uh, principles of the AU, uh, which is to uh, recognize only a single Somali state. Uh, we will uh, not, as a part of this two-track strategy, recognize Somaliland uh, or Puntland, but that does not uh, in any way uh, mean that we do not uh, have any diplomatic and development contact with them if indeed uh, they are, are uh, providing services and benefits to their people uh, in a stable fashion. Uh, this is a U.S. policy uh, made in Washington. Uh, it is not an Ethiopian policy uh, made in Addis Ababa. Uh, I think that we uh, do, in fact, uh, deserve the credit of being able to uh, think for ourselves uh, even when we're dealing with the most complex uh, and intractable problems. Uh, so it is not uh, an old one. Uh, it is a new one. And, uh, and we will, as I said in my remarks, uh, reserve the, the right uh, to make further course corrections if we think that the things that we are doing incorrectly uh, in trying to pursue peace and stability are not working. We will, in effect, uh, look at new approaches, uh, but we will be careful uh, and analytical and thoughtful as we do so. We think that what we're doing now uh, is uh, the right approach. In many ways, this is a segue uh, into uh, the uh, question uh, that our host, uh, Jennifer Cook, asked, and that is the incentives and disincentives. Clearly. Uh, we uh, recognize the importance of trying to support the Djibouti process. But we have also made it very, very clear uh, that uh, the TFG uh, does not have uh, a blank check uh, on its engagement uh, and relationship uh, with the United States uh, government. Uh, we are interested uh, in the same things uh, that they're interested in, uh, and that is uh, peace, uh, stability, uh, return to uh, economic development and an end to the uh, refugee crisis and an end to uh, the accommodation in parts of uh, South Central of, uh, of, of uh, extremist elements. Uh, we have encouraged and will continue to uh, encourage the, uh, the TFG, as I said, uh, to uh, be uh, more uh, than simply a government uh, in name uh, only. Uh, it must uh, deliver services uh, to its people. It must uh, end uh, the bitter uh, political infighting that has uh, crippled its ability and effectiveness uh, as a government. It must stop the uh, pervasive corruption uh, that uh, sometimes uh, uh, is uh, alleged uh, and found uh, to be true uh, among some of its, uh, of its members. Uh, and we will uh, continue to encourage them to aggressively to follow and pursue the lines uh, of the Djibouti uh, peace process. Uh, not easy, uh, but something that we are determined to uh, push and to push uh, forwardly. Uh, I uh, think uh, our Discussions and uh, engagements with the TFG uh, are extraordinarily uh, frank uh, and, uh, and candid. Uh, Tony, uh, money remittances. If we uh, only knew uh, where the money uh, was actually going and who, uh, in fact, was actually uh, receiving it. Uh, indeed, uh, there have been uh, regulations put in place uh, by Treasury and by U.S. authorities 
to uh, stop uh, remittances. Uh, those regulations were put in place uh, because there was a strong uh, fear uh, in the United States government that these remittances, uh, not all, uh, but some, uh, uh, unsure of how many and how much, were going into the hands of individuals uh, who were carrying out uh, or supporting uh, extremist uh, activities. Our inability uh, to determine who gets uh, these remittances has been the primary reason uh, why they have been uh, choked off. Uh, we know uh, from uh, the movement of uh, young Somalis uh, from uh, Seattle, uh, from uh, Minneapolis, uh, and from uh, places uh, like Cleveland, uh, that uh, there are uh, individuals uh, in this country uh, who are sympathetic uh, to uh, extremist uh, influences. I suspect uh, that where uh, the people go, uh, the money uh, has already proceeded. I think we have to be careful and judicious. Uh, we should not uh, recognize, uh, punish uh, all, uh, but until we can find uh, a better way uh, of dealing with this, and I hope we can at some point, uh, because we do not, in fact, want to uh, deprive those people uh, who rightly are trying to do the right thing to, in fact, do the right thing. So with Pauline, and then Reed, and then Alan. Thank you. Pauline Baker, the Fund for Peace. Johnny, thank you for that presentation, and I want to commend you for uh, introducing a fresh approach to Somaliland and Somalia. Um, I think we've been stuck in a rut for quite a long time. But uh, the landscape that you described did not really deal with the core question of security uh, and the fact that the TFG still holds only a few blocks of Mogadishu and the developmental and humanitarian thrusts of the new policy cannot take root unless there is some governance in Somalia that is lasting and offers some ray of hope to the people that the fighting that will stop at some point so to get back a little bit to Jennifer's first question, what is the theory of change here that you see, the outcome? Where does all this lead to? Um, and how can people envision, if you will, an exit strategy, to use a bad term, but I don't know what other one to use, that, that all this effort will lead to that will have general support of not only the Somali people, but the African governments? And then as a footnote question, uh, could you describe to us uh, the reaction of other African governments to this new strategy? I'm sure you've had consultations. Uh, are there any African governments that are strongly opposed to it? Are there some who are strongly in favor of it and are willing to back it up with maybe the commitment of more peacekeeping troops, for example, to address the first question? Great. Thank you. And then we'll go to Reed. Uh, Reed, Reed Kramer from AllAfrica.com, just really building on Pauline's question. Uh, you spoke about the desirability of putting people from many countries uh, on the ground in Mogadishu and, and even of wanting to have U.S. State Department and AID people in South Central Somalia. Has any consideration been given to creating something akin to the Green Zone in Baghdad where the big international presence that's now basically in Nairobi uh, serving ostensibly at least Somalia could be relocated, or is this simple? Is the security simply uh, too too great a challenge at this point to even consider that option? And then right behind uh, Mohammed Ali. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, nope, Mohammed. Mohammed. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I didn't You're see discriminating you. Discriminating against women. I'm just no. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Next time. Oh Next my time. God, it's a tough uh Oh. <laughs> Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, Muhammad Ali. I'm with Somali American Peace Council. Uh, good afternoon, Ambassador, and uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. You always put Somali into the high list. We really appreciate that. I have a suggestion and a couple of questions. My first suggestion is uh, that how can the State Department, I mean, this is a suggestion that they should really invite Somali American conference nationwide in this country to really put an input 
and uh, I will really recommend that should happen soon, maybe. My two questions is, first one is, when will President Obama is going to uh, high, appoint a high-caliber special envoy to show our seriousness about Somalia situation, somewhere like uh, Mr. Mitchell or Holbrook? And ne next question is, what are we doing about the chemicals that are dumping chemical toxic into Somalia's uh, shores as well as the illegal fishing? Thank you. Okay, and can we just take one more so that I, that accusation doesn't go <laughs> uh, right next door? Okay. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the spot. I'm really yeah. sorry. <laughs> Mariama, I'm from The Voice of America. Two quick question, uh, questions. One has to do with um, piracy, and uh, there was a report that came out just on Monday um, from the um, International uh, Maritime Bureau talking about that the area where the pirates are operating is basically too vast and it's almost uh, unrealistic for the navies to control. So I was wondering what your reaction is to that. But And the second question has to do with the support of AMISOM and the fact that we there are only basically two African countries, Uganda and Burundi. And recently the um, Ugandans actually came out and said that they could send more troops if they had more money from the United States. And uh, I was just wondering where that stands. And it looks like there they were talks between the two countries, between the U.S. and Uganda. And where does that stand? Thank you. Great. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can barely I think, keep track. You know, I, I, yeah. I can uh, <laughs> hardly keep track as well. Muhammad Ali uh, actually had three questions wrapped up in one plus a comment. So <laughs> it gives me, uh, gives me a little bit of a challenge. Let me uh, do as I did before. Uh, start uh, from the rear and move uh, and move forward. Um, we have uh, uh, heard uh, the requests uh, uh, and the desires of not only uh, Uganda but others to increase the number of Amosam troops uh, on the ground. Uh, this issue uh, is likely to be discussed. Uh, and debated at the uh, UN Security Council uh, within the next uh, 30 days. Uh, in principle, uh, we uh, support uh, an increase uh, in the number of troops on the ground, uh, but do not uh, take a position on what that uh, number uh, should be. Uh, I think uh, it uh, is up to others uh, to make that uh, decision. Uh, the United States will continue, as it has uh, over the last two years, uh, to uh, support uh, AMISOM uh, consistent uh, with the uh, amount of budget uh, that we receive uh, in the Department of State and in the U.S. government uh, to do so. So uh, I won't go any uh, further than that. Uh, on your uh, first part of your question uh, about uh, the issue of uh, protecting the uh, seas, uh, there are two answers. Uh, uh, one uh, is that uh, Somalia uh, has the longest coastline of any country uh, in Africa. And that suggests uh, very clearly uh, that there has, in fact, uh, a huge uh, amount of, uh, of, of maritime space uh, out there uh, around it. Uh, second uh, is what I said uh, in my remarks, uh, and that uh, uh, the problem of piracy uh, on the uh, high seas uh, is a problem uh, that uh, ultimately must be solved uh, on the land. The reason why uh, there is piracy uh, is uh, the fact that uh, there uh, is no effective uh, deterrent uh, to prevent uh, those individuals from carrying out criminal uh, activities. Uh, there is a uh, weak uh, economy uh, and poor governance uh, structures. Uh, the pirates uh, can uh, get away uh, uh, with impunity uh, with their actions. So uh, it, it, it has to be uh, a land-based uh, response. Uh, naval uh, can do uh, a lot to help deter, uh, but it is not the ultimate solution. Uh, Mohammed, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, 
a great deal has been said uh, about uh, the dumping of uh, toxic waste uh, and other uh, uh, pollutants and, uh, and, and refuge off the Somali uh, coast. Uh, but I would uh, say that while some of that uh, clearly goes on, no doubt clearly goes on, uh, the greatest problems uh, are again land-based problems. Uh, it is the instability which exists uh, onshore uh, which allows for those uh, uh, predations uh, to uh, exist offshore. Uh, if Somalia uh, had a uh, government uh, that functioned uh, effectively, uh, had a coast guard, uh, a military uh, that defended its uh, economic territorial waters, uh, these things would not happen. Uh, and so until there is effective governance, uh, these things will probably likely uh, to continue. But I will add, uh, out of analytic uh, fairness, uh, I think that, that the issue of dumping uh, of toxic waste uh, and is probably uh, greatly exaggerated. It does go on, but I think uh, it is uh, more uh, a, a distraction uh, than uh, a reality. Uh, a conference uh, on uh, for, for Somalis. Uh, the Department of State uh, over the last several years has had an aggressive program of reaching out to the Somali American diaspora across this country. Uh, officers in my bureau have gone uh, from Maine to Seattle with stops in, uh, uh, in, in Cleveland, uh, Minneapolis where I have met and spoke to the uh, Somali community, uh, into Chicago and St. Louis uh, and other places as well. Uh, we try uh, to listen to the voices uh, of the diaspora because you probably uh, have uh, greater insights uh, on many things uh, that we do not see uh, as a result of not being on the ground uh, in Mogadishu. But we also uh, encourage uh, the community uh, not uh, to carry uh, the divisions which exist uh, at home uh, onto uh, the American landscape and therefore undermine your ability to be helpful in bringing about uh, a uh, solution to the problems uh, that exist uh, in Somalia. Uh, we want uh, the di diaspora to play uh, a positive role. We encourage the diaspora to play uh, a positive role, uh, an influential role, uh, a role that will provide uh, those on the ground uh, with a sense of hope and encouragement uh, that things can, in fact, uh, get much better. Uh, a special envoy, uh, not at this time. Uh, special interest, uh, absolutely yes. Uh, read uh, on the green zone. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, supported very strongly the presence of uh, the AU uh, and the UN on the ground uh, on a 24-7 basis. The new uh, SRSG, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Mahiga uh, signaled, uh, uh, and it has uh, been uh, reaffirmed by uh, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, that uh, the uh, UN will, in effect, uh, put uh, people on the ground uh, in Mogadishu uh, on uh, a permanent but rotating uh, basis. Uh, the AU uh, has also indicated that it intends to uh, put an uh, office uh, in um, Mogadishu, again, permanent but with rotating uh, staff. I think uh, if I can speak uh, uh, m modestly for both of uh, those organizations based on what I know, uh, there is uh, a desire to uh, put uh, their flags and their presence on a permanent basis there and as security uh, permits uh, to move from rotational staff uh, to more permanent uh, staff. Uh, I think this is a, a positive signal to the people of Somalia that the international community uh, cares and is concerned. 
Uh, it is a signal to uh, others uh, that uh, the international community will not be easily uh, driven away or turned back uh, on, uh, turn its back on Somalia. So I think that uh, that I think is a, is a good and promising, uh, a good and promising development. Uh, UN Secretary General's remarks uh, were made, uh, I think on September 24th, uh, at a uh, conference he sponsored on Somalia uh, uh, during the UN General Assembly. So that, that there is public uh, uh, pronouncement on that. Um, and I'm probably uh, jumping over. Uh, Pauline uh, had uh, the, uh, the, the first question, uh, and, and that is uh, related to security. Uh, where does this all lead? Uh, where does this all lead? Uh, what is the exit strategy? Um, and uh, what are African government reactions to this? Uh, largely, uh, to the extent that we've had them, uh, the reactions of uh, African governments uh, towards what we are doing uh, have been positive, uh, and we've seen, uh, I think, uh, positive reactions uh, not only uh, among commentators uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the United States, but we've seen uh, positive commentary on what we're doing uh, from uh, those in Europe who are also uh, following this, uh, this, uh, this issue. Uh, as I said, we are going to be uh, consistent uh, with the AU position. And while uh, our second uh, track clearly uh, moves us into a posture of engagement with uh, Somaliland and Puntland, uh, we have no intention, and I underscore no intention, of uh, recognizing uh, those governments. We have no intention of doing uh, anything that is inconsistent with the principle outlined uh, by the AU and EGAD with, re with respect to those states. But I think it is also important for us to, uh, to engage and to acknowledge what has uh, been going on in both of uh, those um, uh, countries. Um, uh, it's always uh, nice to uh, have uh, a clear roadmap uh, to uh, uh, an exit of, uh, uh, towards stability and, and peace. But I think the, the reality is, is that uh, this is going to be uh, a, a, a long, uh, un sometimes uncertain, uh, uh, and, uh, and difficult process uh, getting to, the, uh, to, to where we want to, to go. Uh, we're going to see uh, uh, probably a succession of, of potholes uh, and even uh, defeats, uh, certainly some setbacks before we get to where we want to go. Uh, but I think the most important thing for us uh, is to uh, remain engaged, uh, consistent in our engagement, uh, and firm in the kinds of principles uh, and outcomes uh, that we're seeking. Uh, it will take uh, us some time uh, to uh, both uh, mobilize uh, international community support as it is required. It's going to take uh, some period of time to get the kind of uh, cohesiveness within the Somali community that is required, and it's going to take some time uh, to get the capacity up to speed uh, in Mogadishu to have the kind of stability uh, that will allow for progress. Uh, there is no short answer uh, to, uh, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the exit, uh, but I think uh, we have seen clearly uh, what uh, benign neglect uh, can do. Uh, we have seen uh, what uh, uh, turning our backs and, and walking away uh, can do. Uh, we have ourselves uh, a, a very clear history, and we should be very frank about this, a very clear history uh, of uh, our involvement and engagement uh, in uh, Somalia. Uh, it's a difficult period. It's a difficult history. Uh, but we in this country are not uh, 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 accustomed to uh, uh, closing our eyes to history. We remember 
uh, Black Hawk Down. We remember the reasons for uh, the, uh, the disengagement. We also remember the very honorable reasons why we went into uh, Somalia before that to address one of Africa's uh, most serious humanitarian crises. Uh, but when we uh, walked away uh, from uh, Somalia uh, in 1993 and early 1994, uh, when we uh, closed the, the door uh, to uh, this uh, very difficult uh, period in our own uh, history, uh, we thought that uh, the fire uh, that was uh, uh, raging uh, in the kitchen would probably burn itself out. But over 20 years, uh, what we did see is the fire not only consumed the kitchen, it consumed the entire house, and then it consumed the neighbor's house, it consumed the uh, village, the city, the community, uh, and the state. And so today what we have uh, is not only a problem in Somalia uh, that I characterize as, uh, as an aggressive cancer that has spread to the region and has now become uh, a much more serious uh, global crisis, uh, a crisis of piracy, a crisis of foreign fighters, uh, and uh, the continuing flow of uh, illegal arms and weapons and peoples uh, throughout the, the region. Uh, undermining uh, some of our strongest uh, friends and colleagues uh, in the area, uh, and most especially uh, a country like Kenya. Uh, we have seen terrorism uh, and suicide bombings uh, move uh, from uh, a Middle Eastern context to a Mogadishu context uh, to uh, the events dramatically of July 11th uh, uh, in uh, Kampala where we saw two uh, suicide uh, bombers. Uh, these are things that we cannot, uh, in fact, uh, uh, ignore. Uh, but I also want to make very clear that our goal there is a comprehensive policy. Our most important desire is to see stability, uh, is to see uh, security, uh, to see economic uh, development, and to see uh, a return to uh, an end to the cycle of humanitarian uh, disaster. That's what we, uh, what we really want to, 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 try to, uh, to, to try to achieve. Uh, and as I said, uh, it can only be done uh, by the resolve and commitment uh, of the Somali people uh, combined with uh, those states in the region uh, as well as the international community, uh, each playing uh, a particularly uh, important part uh, in this process. But if we walk away, uh, and that is uh, if the United States walks away uh, from uh, a situation. Uh, most uh, others tend to walk away even faster. Uh, again, we can't resolve it uh, singly, but it is important uh, for us to try to mobilize uh, international attention uh, and to galvanize uh, the kind of support that's necessary uh, to uh, do it. But again, uh, Somalis, have to be uh, very much a part of the solution. We are, we have two minutes. I have, I want to add one last question, if you don't <laughs> mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> because I think it, it's an important one. It seems that we're hanging a great deal here on the African Union in terms of that core security question that um, uh, Pauline asked. Um, it's, it's a situation into which even the hardiest UN peacekeepers would not like to go. It's not clear what their task will be in terms of fighting off an insurgency. It's not really a peacekeeping, peace enforcement. It's almost a battle task. Um, it's not simply, I think, a question of numbers, but also capacities and training. You know, we've seen some of the blowback uh, from kind of collateral damage and that kind of counterinsurgency tactics and so forth. So. I, I wonder if, and, and that Love was a pretty, it. that was a nice <laughs> ending right there, but I had to get this question in, was, you know, uh, how are we changing, how is our military going to change its engagement perhaps with the African Union, with TFG training, and then just to clarify, will there be any kind of security assistance to the, uh, these uh, autonomous governments? Well, again, uh, a great question, which would require a, a much longer answer okay, than the sorry. two minutes. But let me let me uh, let me respond uh, again in, in reverse order. 
uh, in uh, our uh, new and enhanced engagement uh, with both Somaliland and with Puntland and with especially the groups in South Central. Uh, we do not uh, view this uh, as a military uh, engagement. We do not uh, envisage uh, the provision of any, and I underline any, military assistance or support uh, to groups uh, in South Central. Uh, we will provide uh, support uh, that is traditionally uh, of the, given by uh, USAID uh, youth empowerment programs, uh, micro microfinance, uh, uh, micro uh, uh, enterprise, uh, water uh, provision points, things like this. We are not trying to uh, arm or to create uh, military uh, establishments uh, in South Central uh, that are in opposition uh, to the TFG. We have no desire to do that, full stop. Uh, in our relationship uh, with uh, Puntland uh, and uh, Somaliland, uh, we uh, do not uh, see these, uh, uh, we do not see our relationship uh, as a military relationship. Uh, our relationship will be to provide uh, development uh, assistance uh, in small ways that will help uh, those governments to uh, improve their economic and development uh, circumstances and not to uh, make their armies uh, bigger and stronger. Again, very emphatically, uh, the desire there is not uh, to create uh, uh, political entities uh, that are in military uh, opposition uh, to the authorities uh, in Mogadishu. We hope that all of these uh, political entities uh, will at some point uh, in the future feel confident enough uh, that they will see that it is in their long-term interest to reunite in some kind of a, uh, of a uh, political relationship that has uh, them under uh, one uh, Somali nation and one Somali flag, which is what the AU recognizes uh, right now. So it is not uh, political relationships, uh, it's not military relationships that we seek, uh, but uh, uh, economic uh, development relationships and relationships that will strengthen uh, their respect for democracy, respect for human rights, uh, and their desire to uh, continue the level of stability uh, that exists in those countries. Now I'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time. Uh, thank you. Join me in thanking our <laughs> secretary.